Farfetch denounced a transformational deal sending FTCH stock over 50% higher this past week. Is this the beginning of a much larger run? To understand Farfetch, they're the leading luxury e-commerce platform, 1,400 different partnered brands, around 3.7 million active customers on the Farfetch site. How does this business model work? You have a couple of different revenue streams. One is they buy inventory and then sell it. That's effectively the first party digital platform. The other aspect, which is much more lucrative, is third party, effectively a store within the Farfetch site where individual partners sell their goods and they get a 30% take that is much higher margin business around 70 percent gross margin business they also own brands outright brand platform and they also have physical in stores physical stores where they're selling luxury goods to top that off so not only do you have this sort of marketplace model you know with 1400 different brands and 3.7 million active consumers you also have farfetch platform solutions which provides white label e-commerce solutions that's increasingly trusted by major brands like harrods this means that they've built the tech so that way, if you are a luxury brand and say, hey, you know what? Running a website's a real pain and running all the different modules tied to it. This is actually a lot more than we signed up for. We just want to focus on, let's say, building brand awareness and selling physical goods at a high markup. Running this whole website, this is a lot tougher than we expect. Well, you know what? This is where they come in. And in a sense, it does sort of remind me of like Amazon's AWS, which is like providing all this different functionality to all these different businesses. And that's sort of what they're doing. Sort of saying, hey, we've got you covered. If you are this luxury brand, we can help you run your site. We've done it and we're doing it with lots of different brands. And so to think about the business model here, very small percentage of their contribution profit is from their physical in-store business around 30% is from about a third of their business is from their own brand revenue. The last and major component is their digital platform, which is around 60% driving their contribution profit. Of that 60%, the vast majority comes from that third party business that getting that 30% take rate from the merchants that sell on their platform. So that high margin, around 70% gross margin on for those third party sales on their platform. The transformational deal this past week was with Farfetch partnering effectively with Richemont, where they are effectively re-platforming a lot of Richemont's assets, various different brands, um, using the Farfetch platform solution, saying, hey, we like what you've done. You have the best infrastructure. Let's use it. And so not only do you have this transformational aspect, moving all these assets over to the Farfetch platform solutions, but you're also seeing several of the Richemont assets moving on to the Farfetch marketplace as well. So this is sort of not only do you have the brands that are going to get powered effectively by the platform solutions, but some of the brands are also going to be selling on the Farfetch website, the marketplace. And there's also this transformational investment in Uke's Netta Porter, uh, which is just, you know, very intriguing. A lot of investors are going, oh, very intriguing. So looking at this, this is a transformational deal. You're looking at you know, a lot of different sites that are going to be re-platformed using effectively the infrastructure from Farfetch. A lot of, you know, top brands, Cartier, Mont Blanc, Ux, Netta Porter, Mr. Porter, a lot of different things. But key is here that management's talking about how the amount of business that's going to get transferred over is around $3 billion in GMV. That's effectively the business on their platform that they're expecting to get transferred over. This is versus $3.6 billion last year. So this is nearly a doubling of their business on their digital platform. This is expected to be higher margin, that 70% margin business, gross margin business. So this is very intriguing. Now, exact ter terms of the deal haven't been announced, but you know it is very intriguing to think about what this economics could be. And this deal where they're acquiring a sizable stake, it's not a controlling stake, but a, around a 40% stake, 40, 40, 50% stake in Ukes and Netta Porter. This is effectively acquiring the number two e-commerce player with luxury goods. So this is very interesting when you see consolidation in a space like this. Now it's going to take some time. This deal management has said is expected to close by 2023. They're expecting to have a new CEO for it. And there's also sort of saying, hey, long-term we might be able to buy the whole thing, but it's gonna require that the business is 
is EBITDA positive, adjusted EBITDA positive for three out of four consecutive quarters and, and over a 12 month period basis. So, I mean, the, there's a lot of sort of contingencies here. You also have to have regulatory approval whenever you're sort of limiting the competition saying, hey, the number one player is buying the number two player. Well, we'll see if that happens. That's part of the reason why they're saying, yeah, this is going to happen at the end of next year. So we'll see. So the question is, where does Farfetch stock go from here? Well, thinking about Farfetch, thinking about their opportunity, you know, I, I look at this and think they're tapping into this huge market, $400 billion market for, you know, personal luxury goods over time. Right now it's closer to 300, 350 billion, but over time, 400 billion, the online portion of that is much smaller, let's say around a hundred billion ballpark figure. And so they're trying to capture that. They're still only a small fraction of that. But if they captured over time, you know, this company could go up significantly and could sort of continue to capture this very long tailwind. And this is arguably this is the type of company that I am looking for on my own personal investment journey. I call that out on at unrivaledinvesting.com where I'm looking for these types of compounders that I could say, hey, this is this has this long term trajectory. You know, and I and I think this has the potential to go up several hundred percent, maybe even thousands of percent over time. And so looking at something like this, you know, Sarah's saying, yeah, they are tapping into this huge market opportunity. They have posted that historical growth that's very compelling. And management's even talked about, hey, we've reached full year adjusted EBITDA, um, positive adjusted EBITDA. And when you see huge upside potential, you want to say, well, wait a second, are you actually going to get there? Like that's that's the promised land, but you know, will you be able to cross the desert? And it's not clear. Um, that's that's the sustainability of the underlying business model. And you're looking at their financials and say, wait a second, they're talking about, hey, congratulations, you just had adjusted EBITDA positive, you know, this past year. But that was still a cash burn of over three hundred million dollars. OK, if you if this doesn't finally put to bed that using any figure like adjusted EBITDA is just complete horse baloney, like I would just ignore it. Because in my opinion, like cash, cash is the, what drives a business ultimately. And so looking at what happened to 2021, yes, if you add back amortization, which arguably you can, and you add back stock based compensation, which I view as an expense, it means you're being diluted to the tune of $200 million, then you are closer to break even. But the fact is management is investing significantly in, in, in inventories and receivables. This is not Amazon.com where Amazon benefits from working capital over time. This is a business where you're seeing it investing significantly in working capital. And that resulted in a sizable $300 million cash burn. And you might say, well, isn't that going to reverse itself this year? Whoop, nope, that didn't happen because you're looking at what's happening so far in 2022. And in the first half of this year, they've burned over $400 million. They had cash on hand of $575 million at the end of this period, expected to improve during the second half of this year to $650 million. I just don't like seeing pictures like this. I don't like situations like this is a huge turnoff for me when I, where you're looking at a company that for a long period has been cash burn. Even if they're able to get to closer to break even, that's really what I need to see. I want to see significant free cash flow in order to get me excited and looking at something like this where it's like, oh, we just burned effectively you know, two thirds of two thirds of our remaining cash. Um, you know, if, if you're thinking about it, 575 versus that 400 million, that just makes me extremely uncomfortable. Now, it's a good chance that they do remedy that. But it's like, well, wait a second. What if like the economy goes into the complete gutter in the next few months? Like, would they still be in a good position? Would they need to raise capital? Now, you might say, well, Daniel, you're you're you need to recognize that the stock's already down like 80 percent over the last two years. So Heck, if if sentiment improves and they continue to execute, you know, doesn't this mean that there's like 500 percent upside because the stock's just completely hammered over time? Doesn't this suggest hundreds of percent upside? And so, well, let's take a second to understand. So this deal with uh, Richemont, Yuke's uh, Netta Porter. What you're talking about is they're issuing a lot of stock. They're issuing around 53, maybe it's 59 million worth or 59 million shares of Farfetch stock, which they estimate is around 10 to 11% of the fully diluted share count. So let's say all in around 530 million shares, that might be low, currently at a stock price of around $12. So that's around $6.4 billion, you know, sort of adjusted market valuation for 
what this business now looks like or potentially looks like if the deal goes through. Thinking about that additional three billion in you know GMV that's going to go across their platform because you know it's going you know on their far fetched platform solutions going on their digital platform. So maybe that bumps up their revenue if you think about a thirty percent cut. Maybe their revenue jumps from around two point something billion to three point five billion in the next year or two. The way to think about it. Then keep in mind they're nowhere near this. But let's let's slap on a twenty percent operating margin which they're not at currently their 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 gross margins are currently around 45%. So let's let's think maybe this gets valued at you know 20% operating margin so 700 million. So like is that really crazy compelling like okay so this deal goes through you have a 6.4 billion dollar adjusted market cap you have potential operating profits of around 700 million maybe you have this long growth ray of growth runway of you know let's say 10 to 20%. And so it's like 700 million versus 6.4 billion. I'm sure there's some additional upside because of the Ukes and Netta Porter asset that you now own, you know, sub 50% of that should be, you know, factored in there. But so I'm thinking maybe you're looking at 100%, 200%, maybe 300% upside just based on that sort of rough valuation, just very rough back of the envelope of like maybe you get valued at like 700% operating profit versus that 600, 6.4 billion in adjusted market cap. I just think there's a lot of ifs there. You know, you're looking at a business that, yeah, we had positive adjusted EBITDA, but actually we burned 300 million and oh, we're gonna burn another 400 million the next six months. Like, oh my gosh, like why why do you wanna go on a journey like that? And and also I think it's important to to let's 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 take a step back, folks. Like there's 20 million US homes that are behind on energy bills. I'd argue what you're going to see in Europe is even worse. Now you might say, well, wait a second, Daniel, like the folks that are buying these goods, you know, it's like the top 1% represents 30% of their business. The top 1% of their customers represent 30% of the business. So it's like the ultra extreme tail of consumers. Like, are they really going to stop shopping? Even if there's a, uh, you know, even if many people have trouble paying for electricity, I think ultimately it's sort of like, yeah, I do think they'll get hit. I, at the at the end of the day, it's like I I do suspect the ultra rich might pull back themselves if they sort of say, "Oh man, people, <laughs> you know, people the, people don't have electricity." I you know, like, oh my gosh, like that's a problem. Um, so like I'm thinking about this, and I'm saying to myself, "Well, why not wait?" Especially if you're thinking from the perspective of, okay, maybe I'm penciling out 100, 200 percent upside. Why not wait? to see like, okay, let's actually get to that sustainable business model where your free cash flow positive, because if you truly are tapping into, let's say a $400 billion market, you will have decades of growth effectively ahead of you. And so why not, like right now it's a $2 billion revenue business. Maybe it gets to three and a half with this deal going through with and, and favorable organic growth. And so that management's talking about, oh, 2023 is going to be, be a great year for them. I'm thinking Europe's going to have trouble. A lot of Europeans are going to have trouble, you know, paying their energy bills. And the U.S. is currently having trouble paying their energy bills. And keep in mind, U.S. energy bills are probably going to be a lot lower than European. So I'm I'm looking at this data point and I'm thinking it, it doesn't really make sense to me. Like from from my perspective, if you're if you're a lottery ticket investor and you're like, oh, I want to own 0.1 percent half percent or one percent of my portfolio and several lottery tickets like i understand that approach and keep in mind this is not financial advice i'm sharing my own personal take on how i consider farfetch you know i look at this i'm thinking you know like if you want to have a bunch of these sort of lottery tickets yeah it's cash burning they haven't really proven themselves out yet you know in terms of actual profitable business model at scale you know they'll talk about oh yeah this platform is profitable let's see it let's see it in the free cash flow man um so I, I look at this and say, okay, if 2023 is supposed to be such a great year, 2024 is such a great year, why can't you wait? I'm, I'm playing this game for a multi-decade perspective. Why not wait for owning the cash flow compounders? Maybe they grow at slower rates. Maybe they grow at 10, 20%. But, you know, you buy it at a compelling enough value. 
you know, you don't have to worry about the business blowing up or not surviving a downturn. You know, keep in mind, I, I haven't even covered the fact that they have convertible debt as well. You know, if the stock price goes low enough, then it turns into a problem because then the converts are no longer effectively in the money with the stock price. So then they have to actually pay it out, you know, in terms of paying back the bonds. So like, hey, that that can turn into a, sort of a death spiral because I just showed that they have trouble with their own, you know, they, they don't have trouble with their liquidity. You know, they're saying they're going to be fine. I, I don't like seeing a company burn 400 million in cash with only, you know, sub 600 million on their balance sheet in six months. But hey, you know, every, everyone's going to pick their own journey. That's just not the heartburn that I'm looking for. But if you are looking for the, the types of things that make me feel a little bit more comfortable, where I'm sort of saying, hey, is this a long term compounder that I think I can find? and I'm getting a good value, and I'm potentially covering my rear, and I'm not going to have these blow-up risks, and I'm potentially in a reasonable spot, given the fact that we are in a tougher environment. Once again, you know, you're looking at these macro headlines, and I'd, and I'd argue for a company like this, I would want to be able to pencil out like a thousand percent upside, given all these different dynamics. And my very back of the envelope was like, hmm, in the next year or two, like maybe 200 percent, maybe, maybe more. You know, just just based on, you know, looking at, hey, if this deal goes through. But if you're if you're interested in the picks, you know, the companies that I'm personally buying and what I find to be intriguing, check out unrivaledinvesting.com. If you enjoyed this video, please make a point of hitting that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. And thank you for watching Unrivaled Investing.